uh, Your Excellency, uh, the Vice Chancellor uh, of the University. Uh, I'll start by saying, yes, I would have wanted to be with you um, today, but um, we had bad weather, uh, essentially, nothing very secretive, um, a huge uh, uh, clouds, and, and so I think the visibility was very low, and so we couldn't take off. Hopefully we will take off today because I'm still trying uh, to get to Lusaka. Uh, Professor uh, Anne Sikwi Bele, you have already spoken a lot about uh, the, the, the debt structure and the debt stresses that uh, Zambia is going through and Africa in general is going through. I think we also heard from uh, Eunice. Eunice, thank you very much and to all of the ECA staff. Uh, let me also recognize the young economists who are in the room, uh, both uh, in Lusaka and maybe I heard at some point that we had people from Harare, the Zambia Economic Society. It's a little bit difficult uh, to ha have this conversation with you because I cannot see you. I don't know who is in the room. I don't know how many people are in the room. Um, so I feel as if I'm talking to uh, an, an empty screen, but I'm assuming there's people in the room and there's many of you. So thank you so much for making the time uh, to come. Uh, listen, a lot has already been said in the last hour, I think, listening to you. I had some slides and some presentations, but I was wondering, actually, maybe that, um, uh, yes, we could go through it. You know a lot of, of this. I'll uh, go through it really quickly and then maybe ask you, uh, yes, I can begin to see that. I begin to see the room a little bit better now. Uh, uh, and, and, and maybe have an engagement about, you know, what do we need to do? How are we, what, what do we need to do to go forward in the global economic community today? Uh, by way of uh, a conversation either about debt, about growth, or, uh, uh, you know, what we need to do. I think when we listen and when we read, most of you, to a lot of the news that is coming out of the continent or the world at large, you will hear a lot about debt, very little about growth, and, and, and I think, and or investment. And this is really the challenge, I think, for our continent, is that if we continue to, to, to focus on, on the sort of debt uh, conversation, we never really get to the point where we talk about investment, where we talk about growth, and where we begin to talk about that relationship between debt and growth. And, and, and so part of, I hope, what I would try to live with you, uh, with you today in this conversation is that if we as Africans do not take the conversation in a different direction, we will continue to talk about debt and most often when we talk about debt, we talk about bad debt, right? There's different kinds of debt, but a lot of times when uh, the conversation in the global space uh, uh, refers to debt, that conversation is always within a framework that says that uh, debt was not necessarily well used. Uh, and, and so uh, we cannot essentially honor the debt uh, uh, as we go forward. So, so, so I, I think that's the first point that I want to leave with you, but maybe we'll just go through very quickly the slides uh, for Zambia to see why we're having this conversation on Zambia and uh, 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 why we need to, to, to talk about both debt, but also about growth and investment as we go forward. Um, so if you look at the, the, the growth trends of Zambia, at the end of the day, we're looking at growth, we're looking at uh, uh, GDP per capita as well. You know, Zambia did well, uh, up until about 2009, and then we see growth beginning to plummet and has continued in, a, in an almost downward spiral uh, uh, up until 2022. Of course, some of that has been because of external shocks, but a lot of it has been also because of uh, uh, decisions or the fact that you know, resources were not invested in the right places. And if you look at in the next slide, you know, uh, what has happened, we pulled together you know, commodity exporters of the continent, just to give some sense of where, what, what is happening to the rest of the commodity exporters on the continent. As we see, Guinea is going in, in, in a different direction. Guinea, I must say, has one of the best uh, commodity uh, investment laws on the continent, which means it has laws around local content, around the use of the mining sector, uh, the, the interlinkages of the mining sector with the rest of the, the, the local economy which means that when we have cycles of growth and cycles of booms in the commodity exporting market, the internal economy has a whole supply chain linkage that continues to grow and stays uh, uh, active even when we have slumps uh, in, in the economy. Unlike, of course, Nigeria, which still has an oil economy that is very delinked from the rest of the, 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 the system. Uh, Angola is just now beginning to do some reforms that hopefully 
would get its its economy a little bit more linked, its internal economy a little bit more linked to the trade divorce sectors. Here we see, of course, uh, commodity prices as uh, and, and the behavior of commodity prices with growth uh, of many of the other African countries that we're talking about. Most of these countries are similar countries. Uh, 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 like uh, So I'm on the next slide on commodity prices as a key, key influence uh, of GDP growth. Um, as you can see, uh, if you look at the, the, the different the lines, you will see Zambia, most of those countries are acting in the same way. Uh, Nigeria and Equatorial Guinea are a little bit outliers because they tend to have much uh, larger shocks in the last, uh, between 2020 and 2022, uh, essentially also because there was a contraction uh, uh, in demand externally as well. Zambia's debt stock, if we go to the slide, what does this mean for Zambia? What uh, does it look like for Zambia when we talk about debt? Uh, as you see in, in the, uh, the 2000 to 2005, that stock was high, it went down. Then we had the HIPIC period, 2006 to 2014. This is the period as well where we see Zambia growing, uh, but there was also a commodity boom. So we, we were living through a commodity boom up until about 2014, 2015. Then we see uh, debt uh, going back up again. Um, if you look at the, the, the rate of debt, uh, and, and that's one of the things that we want to look at, is it's one thing to talk about debt, but it's another thing to look at the rate of debt accumulation, right? Because you, you, your debt can go up very slowly uh, over a long time or go up very quickly. And it's those periods where we see spikes that are important to look at and to understand what was happening in the economy and what happens post uh, those periods of, uh, of debt spikes. What we see for uh, Zambia, of course, is that between 20, 20, uh, 2001 and 2010, uh, essentially, we had a drop in the, uh, as we saw in the slide before, debt was dropping uh, uh, in, in between 2005 and 2010, still, you know, uh, a negative rates of increase in debt, which means essentially you had debt, but it was you were uh, actually decreasing your rates of lending. 2011 and 2015, huge spike in, in, in debt. Now the question then becomes, is this spike in debt related to huge investment, a huge investment cycle. And we're looking, we're working with the numbers to take a look at it, because that is where we begin to talk about good debt and bad debt, right? To have a spike in debt is not in itself a bad, a bad thing. But what we then need to see is the cost of the debt and did that debt lead to growth? Now, if the debt didn't lead to growth, as we see in Zambia's case, debt didn't lead to growth, it means implicitly that a lot of that debt was not invested in the right areas. And I think this is something that is missing in the conversations today around debt. We keep talking about debt again. We don't talk about growth and we don't talk about investment. In Zambia, for example, I think what will be useful is to be able to identify where did that debt go? What did we use it for? And, and, and there is a huge momentum now to talk about debt transparency and you know what kind of debt, where the debt is coming from, and, and it's only if we have those kinds of conversations, if you take debt and you use it, in, in the case of Guinea, we saw before, Guinea took debt because there was a commodity boom and Guinea invested in huge energy uh, 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 production. So what we saw was Guinea went from 16% access to energy to 35% access to energy, uh, a growth in the economy, of course, uh, followed, we know that the elasticity of investments in energy to growth is about 0.7%. And so immediately you begin to see growth in the economy. What would be nice as, as students of economics and the students of the Zambian economy will be to look at some of the investments that Zambia did and see whether we see this kinds of positive elasticity relationships between what Guinea, what Zambia invested in and uh, uh, the debt that it took. The, the next conversation, of course, is the cost of the debt and whether uh, 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 the, the, the debt that was incurred was debt that was, whose cost was cheaper than the investment that we made. And I'll come back to that in a second. If you look at the uh, debt of the commodity exporters, uh, again, the same uh, set of countries that I talked about, you look at Angola, we have almost the same period. Angola also went through a little bit of, of a debt restructuring and, and, and of course, because of the commodity boom between 2000 and 2014, we see debt to GDP because GDP was growing the denominator, we see debt to GDP dropping. Uh, look at what happens with Guinea, debt to GDP consistently drops. 
because over the period between 2000 and 2014, there was structure, there was deep enough structural reform in the Guinean economy that led to a transformation of the underlying diversification of the different sectors of production. So we were able to see you know, investments in, in, in roads, investments in energy, as I said before, but also the structural composition of the, the mining sector, which was now more interlinked uh, with the domestic economy. Uh, of course, we see Equatorial Guinea, which is essentially uh, has not transformed its economy, hasn't reshaped its economy, which remains a, a, an economy that is heavily uh, debt ridden. Um, if we look at um, Zambia's debt grew considerably and it grew faster than uh, most of the other commodity exporters. So again, we, we, we look at Zambia and we say to ourselves, you know, what was Zambia doing with its debt and, and where was that debt going? Uh, what different sectors of, of the Zambia's economy? If we look at the, the, the slide 10, uh, share of commodities in exports, um, if you, if you look at Zambia again, and, and this is just a comparison between Angola, Nigeria, and Zambia, the co commodity exports as a share of your overall uh, exports. Zambia has one of the lowest uh, shares of commodity exports. So even though we talk a lot about commodity uh, exports, the Zambian economy still needs to continue to diversify and diversify into segments of the economy where it can continue to be an important export sector. Of course, when we talk about uh, a low, we're talking about 80%, right? So you're still heavily dependent and we'll come back to the conversation on the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement and what we can do uh, uh, as an economy to see whether we can diversify our exports away from one commodity and also begin to do a uh, transformation as we do that. The, the, the slide on your left, I think, uh, is, is just a, 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 a share of total exports uh, compared to uh, exports of iron ore. Of course, uh, if, we, if, if exports uh, drop you're, and, and you're still importing, and particularly because we are African economies are still essentially emerging market economies, so we import a lot of what we need for our investment. So more often than not, our current account balances are negative because we are importing uh, more than we are exporting. Our fiscal stance, next slide, uh, uh, is also we have gone through a very difficult and steep uh, period post 2014. So you begin to see uh, the fiscal balances and our primary balances all in negatives uh, because of course, commodity prices are dropping, revenue to GDP is dropping. We're continuing to spend uh, the same. And so we have uh, uh, tighter fiscal conditions. Plus our uh, debt service is be beginning to become higher. We talk about fiscal space, we have less fiscal space uh, to be able to address any other new. And this is actually what makes it difficult to do reforms, right? If you don't have the fiscal space to support any kinds of additional reforms that can transform your economy, then you're stuck with the economy that you have because you can only get the resources from where you have them, but then you're paying debt. And, and so essentially you don't have space to support the emergence of new segments of the economy. Because when you have high debt to GDP, as we heard, from the vice chancellor, uh, you have crowding out. The private sector cannot access resources and or cannot access them at affordable rates. So we get a little bit of crowding out, even though we see in Zambia's case that we've had an active uh, private sector for some work that we are trying to look at the impact of debt on the private sector and credit availability. It does seem like in the sort of last segments, the last 10 years, private sector uh, activity and credit to the private sector has continued to grow. So we're trying to unpack that to understand uh, what is happening there. But one of the big and fundamental things that has changed overall, and this is a big conversation that we should all be having, is, is the, the composition of, of Africa's debt, the composition of Zambia's debt in particular. As you would see in the slide, Zambia's debt has moved from mostly concessional between 1990 and 2005, as you will see, actually all the way to 2012, you essentially had, you know, World Bank debt, uh, which is the dark blue. Uh, you had concessional debt, which is essentially bilateral uh, 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 concessional debt from, you know, uh, the UK, uh, uh, the US and, and others, France. And then you have official creditors that also have uh, 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 a concessional debt uh, to you. But then as we move out, you begin to see between 2012 and 2020, a, 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 the, the, the light blue color, which is private creditors. And of course, private creditors, uh, private sector debt, 
private sector debt is slightly more expensive. Bondholders, bondholders, uh, that's the euro bond market, also cheaper than private creditors, but also expensive debt. And commercial banks, essentially what we call export credit uh, agencies, again, very expensive debt. So you see, we move away from uh, mostly concessional debt, which means debt that is cheaper. And most of the time, the cost of that debt is lower than your rate of growth to private creditors, bondholders, and, and, and commercial banks whose rates uh, begin to become uh, quite onerous. And this is where the conversation around debt becomes very, very important. As you see in the next slide, the share of concessional debt to total debt totally declines. Uh, and, and we go from uh, 40, 50% of concessional debt, which means debt that is affordable, which means that that is cheaper uh, to a, 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 a uh, only 10% of today, as we have that conversation, and this is very important, look at this slide, only 10% of your debt is concessional debt, which essentially means either IMF and uh, bilateral uh, uh, donors. And, and as we come to a conversation that is, I'm not in Zambia, so I don't know what's in your newspapers, but I'm sure there is a lot of, it, of this conversation in your newspapers. This, this uh, if we can just go back one more slide, maybe to slide 13, if you look at this composition of, of debt and, and who holds your debt, right? Uh, bondholders, private creditors, commercial banks, and then quote unquote, the Paris club, if you want, yeah, is the rest, right? Is the AIDA, uh, the, the, the World Bank and, and the IMF. This is the conversation that we are all having today. Who should sit at the table when we come for debt resolution? How should the debt resolution conversation go and who should have a say? Um, if you go, uh, a, 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 and so the question, normally if we have the Paris Club, the Paris Club has traditionally, because it was made up, this is before we went into HIPIC, the, the Paris Club was traditionally made up of the World Bank, the IMF and the seven large uh, uh, multilateral creditors. Today we have all this new, you know, private creditors, bondholders and commercial banks in the room, well, we, well, we are not yet sure that they're going to come in the room. And the question is, how can we get them into the room in a way that is constructive and in a way that allows us to do uh, debt resolution? So again, 10%, uh, uh, slide 14, is, is concessional debt. This is the Paris Club, essentially. And so we have, in the case of Zambia, almost 90% of Zambia's debt needs to have somebody else around the table. Who are Zambia's uh, top predators? If you look at uh, uh, the data, and this is data from 2021, so I don't know if it's still current, but most, most of it is, 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 I think, quite current. Uh, the top creditor uh, for, for, for Zambia is China. Then we have bondholders, so this is the euro bond market, uh, commercial creditors as well. And then IDA, that's the World Bank, the International Development Association, which is sort of the IDA is the uh, bucket for the poorest uh, countries, then the UK, other uh, multilateral development banks, the African Development Bank. So that's that's a little bit the breakdown of you know who could be around the table. Now the first four countries or the first four clusters, China, the bondholders, that's the private sector, the World Bank, the United Kingdom, that's part of the Paris Club. We have two clubs, right? We have the London Club and the Paris Club. Normally, when we talk about sort of debt and debt restructuring in the overall uh, development community, the Paris Club essentially was to restructure sovereign. Uh, 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 bilateral debt and multilateral debt. The London Club was really for the private sector. Today, what we're trying to do, as we have seen, because a lot of the African countries now are going to both the private sector and the official bilateral sector, we need to understand how we can bring these two things together, and this, which is why you will hear a lot about a new global financial architecture and how we can work uh, to reshape a new global financial architecture. I talked a little bit about a fiscal space and what kinds of fiscal space countries have. Sometimes when we talk about debt to GDP, and I give the example of Nigeria, Nigeria's debt to GDP is 20%, 20% uh, so very, very low. But Nigeria's external uh, debt service is almost 45% of its expenditure, so very, very high. So when we look at debt and debt burdens, we are not only looking at you know, the share of debt to GDP, we are also looking at your ability to pay, which is part of, you know, uh, your debt service as a share of your ex total expenditure, as a share of your total revenue, and also your reserves, because of course, external debt service is paid in foreign currencies, so whether you have good reserves or not becomes important. 
Also, the maturity is important. And as you can see in the case of Zambia, because Zambia continued to accumulate debt, then you know, the market worries about Zambia's ability to pay. And as you worry about a country's ability to pay, you don't want to extend you know, long-term debt. You can increasingly give them shorter and shorter uh, tenure. As you give them shorter and shorter tenure, it becomes more and more difficult to pay, right? Because every morning uh, there is a new bullet payment that is coming. And so the two things begin to collide with each other. One is as you accumulate debt, we begin to look at, you know, what is the possibility that you can pay back that debt? And then the market penalizes you by giving you shorter term, more expensive debt, and you get into a, a vicious cycle that one needs to get out of. Now, the good news is that uh, uh, Zambia has today decided to, well, I don't know if it's good news, but it is good news that Zambia has said, well, we want to stop and we want to look at how we can restructure our debt, how we can reprofile it so that we can create, if you go back again to um, slide 16, uh, uh, the big reason, the main reason why the government is saying, let's look at this and let's do something about it. It's precisely because uh, if your external debt service, slide 16, which is the external debt service uh, slide, is this high, if you're spending 25% of your GDP, just paying you know, the external community for debt, then you don't have resources to to you know, invest in energy, you don't provide it. If you do 25% debt service, 25% civil service, that's 50%, you know, uh, it teaches health, you know, and you have to do that, you really do not have a lot of space. And then you just have sort of the current uh, normal runnings of the government, current expenditure, you are stuck. Normally, you need debt service uh, to GDP to be below 10%. The, the best is 7.5%. So as you can see, almost three times higher than where you would want to be normally. And, and, and essentially you're crowding out all resources for digitization investment, for investments in all the other things that uh, Zambia needs. And so this is why rightly the government is saying, let's relook at our debt profile. Let's relook at our debt service profiles and see whether we can change this dynamic. Now, the big question is to say, and, and, and before I was going to talk to you a little bit, but maybe I can go through it very quickly. A lot of the work that has now been sort of put out there, and we talk a lot about debt and debt distress and what we should do is, is around when do we have, when is debt too high or when is debt too low? And, and we are looking at, I'm, I'm doing some work with Awing, who is one of our uh, uh, fellows to see, uh, you know, Reinhardt and Rogoff and Reinhardt is now the chief economist of the World Bank that did some work that said that when your debt to GDP is 90%, uh, then it starts constraining growth and you can only grow up by 1%. If you have debt to GDP at 60%, uh, then you can actually have slightly faster growth. There's been a lot of work uh, around that that has said, no, those numbers are not right. Of course, we know that Italy has debt to GDP at about 150%. Uh, 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 Oliver Dunbush came out at some point early, a year ago, it now seems like a decade ago, when interest rates were negative and said, well, because interest rates are negative, we can borrow ourselves to growth, right? Uh, because it didn't matter whether, it, at least if you were growing at the, uh, above 1%, you could borrow as much as you wanted and continue to be able to have the ability to pay because you were growing faster than the cost of debt. Now, of course, as we see monetary tightening in the West, and, and that's an important issue, one of the things that we're seeing is as we get monetary tightening in the West, immediately again, the bondholders, remember that famous graph, the bondholders, the private creditors, the commercial creditors, all borrowed in dollars or euros. Tightening of interest rates in those countries means immediately the next morning, the debt to GDP numbers go up because the currency depreciates. I didn't look at the depreciation of the Zambia currency, but Africa, we have about 20 countries that have witnessed 10% depreciation of their currencies in the last two weeks, uh, 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 and, and sorry, in the last two months. So essentially, without doing anything, your debt to GDP has gone up. Also, your uh, debt service uh, ratios have increased. And so that makes it even more difficult um, for you to be able to service your debt. So now the conversation is, you know, two parts of the conversation, which I want to leave with you, which is work that we're doing, and we would like to come back to you to have that conversation, is to look at the, Ghana, the, the Zambian economy, sorry, Ghana is over, uh, to look at the Zambian economy and say, you know, is it the 90% threshold or is it at the 60% threshold that we saw growth begin to contract, first thing. But second thing that we haven't worked on, I think, in the global economic community enough is to unpack what were the investments. 
uh, that on the on the pinned this debt, and whether the investments that on the pinned this debt were investments whose rates of return were higher than the cost of debt, and maybe as we begin to talk about a new global financial architecture and how we look at sort of debt service sustainability analysis, which is the 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 framework that the international community essentially uses to determine whether countries are solvent or not, and uh, uh, to begin to add in that conversation the rate of return of the investment. Today, we don't have that variable as part of our analysis of debt sustainability, but that is the most critical uh, 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 variable, particularly for emerging market economies, uh, uh, developing market economies like ours, because we wanna know whether the, the resources were used well. It's not enough to just have the conversation around, yes, uh, uh, Zambia's debt or Africa's debt is, is becoming unsustainable. The question is, because that's the only way that we can hold both the populations or the governments accountable for the use of debt, but also those who are giving us the debt. And there is a sense sometimes that there's only a particular segment of the debt uh, uh, that is, 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 is contracted that is uh, not efficient. But I think that if we start looking into all of the debt that is contracted, we will see that in all the segments, you know, uh, either uh, uh, private creditors, bilateral creditors, there is unsustainable debt at entry. And, and maybe we can, rather than wait to the end to go and have a debt restructuring framework, maybe what we have is at entry, the conversations around the sustainability of the investment. If we did that, then we would save Africa the trouble of having to have every 10, every 12, 12 years, these conversations on debt overhangs and debt burdens, and because we can make this information transparent. And I think that's why we have such a very important conversation on debt transparency. Um, so, so this is part of the, the, the work that we're trying to do for growth. Now, the big conversation that we're having in the global financial architecture today is who should sit around the table? How should we do new debt restructuring? In the case of Zambia, I'm sure in your newspapers, I don't know if it's in your newspapers, there's a lot of conversation around the creditor committee has held, we need the private sector to come to the table, we need the private sector to come to the table at comparable terms. Um, see, what is happening is, as you saw, 80% of your debt is no longer concessional debt. We need all the private creditors to come to the table. We need them to take a haircut, which means essentially that they need to agree that the government of Zambia is not going to be able to refund X percent of the debt. This was easy to do on the uh, HIPIC because it was mostly bilateral creditors. Today it's the private sector. The private sector does not like to lose money. And so essentially the conversation has become a lot more difficult to crowd in both those private sector creditors who at the time lent the, the, the resources on very different terms than the World Bank, the IMF, and, and all the bilateral creditors. So the very difficult conversation that we are all having in the global community, three countries have signed up to the common framework, Zambia, Ethiopia, and, uh, and Chad. None of them has been able to come to closure on this debt reprofiling conversation because we've had difficulties of bringing the private sector to the table. Of course, because economies are dynamic, when Zambia signed up for the common framework, commodity prices were, 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 were slumping. In the case of Zambia, still a little bit low. In the case of Chad, oil has gone off the roof. So the private uh, creditors are saying, but you know, Chad has more resources now. Why should we take a haircut? Chad can pay us. And, and so essentially we need to have a common, but, and part of the reason why we're saying we need to restructure the common framework is it has taken 18 months. In 18 months, markets have changed drastically. And now Zambia has to deal with a monetary tightening, which Zambia did not have to deal with six months ago. Monetary tightening means your debt to GDP ratios have become even higher and the situation has gotten worse. And so part of the conversation we're having on the common framework is really to make it time bound, make it six months. From the day Zambia signed in, six months later, we should have a deal. If we don't have a deal, we should stop. Because part of the problem with signing into the common framework is once you're in the common framework, you do no longer have access to any resources. The world is waiting for you to restructure your debt. And so a lot of the conversations we are having is how can we ensure that we can one, bring new bilateral creditors to the table in a timely, time-bound fashion, private sector creditors to the table in a time-bound fashion and bring the Paris Club, which has did very well in the 90s and the to early 2000s, but whose position on the table today is very small. And so does not have the kind of, uh, what we say muscle to be able to bring the private creditors to the table. And, and, and move forward. And he, therein lies, I think, the big difficult conversation for the global international community 
on how to move forward. So uh, this is why, why, in the case of Zambia in particular, we continue to see a lot of conversation, but no end in sight in terms of when we will be able to get uh, to resolution. But we hope we are all pushing and all pre- uh, the, the minister and the governor of the central bank uh, continue to push to see whether we can get resolution uh, faster. I, I stop there. Thank you.